maybe we should just uh, go ahead and get started. I know there's going to be some other people popping in, um, but uh, we want to make sure that we uh, get through all this uh, exciting content we're going to talk about today. So um, uh, let's go ahead and get get going. Uh, so welcome, everyone. Um, my name is Chris McCampbell. I'm the uh, local San Diego chapter chair for SCGD, uh, along with my co-chair here, Stephanie. Um, and uh, SCGD is the Society for Experiential Graphic Design. Uh, we are a professional association of designers working in the fields of architectural signage, environmental graphics, wayfinding, placemaking, um, striving to create meaningful discourse about design's role in shaping how we experience public space. Uh, so along with our San Diego chapter, we have chapters in Orange County, LA, uh, and all over the globe. Um, so please check out our website, segd.org, and see our other upcoming events and uh, what kind of work uh, we all get ourselves into. Um, so today we're we're really excited to have uh, uh, Chris Langdon here from KTUNA, local uh, San Diego landscape architecture, um, and he's going to be talking to us about community placemaking and identity of public parks here in San Diego. Uh, Chris Langdon is principal at KTUNA and a California professional landscape architect. He is responsible for managing a broad range of landscape architectural projects of varying scope from small park sites to large multi-jurisdictional transit projects here in San Diego and beyond. Uh, with over 27 years of experience, Chris is currently designing a number of park projects for the city of San Diego and serves as the chair of design review board for the city of La Mesa. Uh, so I will let uh, the other Chris tell you the rest. Uh, so go ahead and take it away, Chris. All right. Thanks a lot, Chris. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, happy Friday. Uh, thanks for joining us on, on a Friday afternoon. It's beautiful outside. So hopefully people are going to get out and do something this afternoon. Um, before I get started, uh, I saw my mom on the list of attendees. So I just got to give her a quick shout out. I registered her. So mom, glad you made it. Um, so um, and, and thanks for everybody who, who registered and is in attendance today. Uh, I appreciate it. Um, so Chris reached out to me and, and, and asked me if I could put together a little presentation on community placemaking um, and, and talk about a couple of projects that we're working on. And um, there are two very, very different projects. Um, and so there's a lot of contrast, but you know the, the end result and the, and the goals of the projects are very similar. And so, um, I'm going to I'm going to kind of start the presentation off and talk a little bit about community placemaking as a whole um, and, and try to give people an understanding of what that means if, if you're not familiar with the term. Um, and then we'll go into we'll talk about uh, North Park Mini Park, which is a small urban plaza that we're, we're designing and it's in construction right now in North Park uh, behind the observatory theater. Um, and then I'm going to kind of contrast that with a much larger 40 acre. Uh, natural kind of resource park that we're working on down at the Chula Vista Bayfront. That's completely different type of park, different scope. Um, but again, it, it still is kind of falling into that uh, vein of community placemaking. Um, and, and it's, you know, I thought it would be a nice kind of juxtaposition of these two different park projects. Um, so again, my name is Chris Langan. I'm a principal here at KTUA. Uh, KTUA uh, got started in 1970. So we, uh, we just celebrated our 50th anniversary last year, um, and that was squashed a little bit by COVID. So we had we were in the planning process of a, of a pretty large uh, 50th anniversary party, and we had to to put a put it on hold. And so we're not quite sure when we're going to get that off the ground, but it's most likely going to be a, a 50 plus two party or something along that line. So um, I am a, a third generation principal and owner here at the firm, and. The firm's been pretty much rooted in park design since its inception. And so we've been doing this for about 50 years now uh, around San Diego. Um, so I'm gonna kick it off a little bit and talk about you know, what is placemaking. Um, there's a lot of different definitions out there. Uh, one that I found that I've kind of gravitated to is part of the mission statement for uh, a, an advocacy group called Project for Public Spaces. Um, and they, they, their definition is that placemaking inspires people to collectively reimagine and reinvent public spaces as the heart of every community. And I, I really like that. I, I think that's a, a really good 
summary of what placemaking should be. Uh, but again, there's there's a lot of different definitions out there. Um, you know, originally placemaking concepts started in 1960, um, and then in the in the 70s they became the the term became a little bit more commonplace and and started being picked up and used by landscape architects, uh, architects and urban planners. Um, so I'm going to just go through a few broad examples of placemaking and I'm going to start at a very, very large kind of macro level and then bring it down to a very small grassroots level just to kind of demonstrate the breadth of, of scale that placemaking can take. Um, so this everybody recognizes this This is Central Park, the heart of Manhattan. Um, you know, this is placemaking at a, at a huge uh, macro scale. Um, you know, this is this is the identity of Manhattan, and it's probably one of the top three landmarks that people might associate with New York City. So, so you know, very very large scale example. Um, another one is in Boston with the Rose Kennedy Greenway. Um, this is an amazing network of parks that kind of wind their way through the core of the city, um, and again, you know, give the city a lot of identity. Um, these these parks host a lot of different festivals and events. Um, and, and really kind of contributed to the community of downtown, downtown Boston. Uh, another one, San Francisco, the Embarcadero, um, you know, in the waterfront. Again, another very, very large uh, example of, of placemaking and, and how, it, how it shapes and, and activates a city. Um, a little bit more recent project is the High Line uh, in New York City and, and the reimagination of these elevated rail lines into public open space and parks. Um, uh, again, another, another great kind of energize and, and, and kind of reimagine space. Um, and then Millennium Park in Chicago, another amazing space. If you've ever been there, there's always people there, um, you know, always something to do, something to see. You know, everybody wants to get their picture taken in front of the bean. Um, and then that interactive fountain is pretty amazing to experience as well. So, you know, these are very, very large examples of, of placemaking. So then I'm going to talk a, about a couple of San Diego examples. Um, and the first one is, you might think is a little odd, and it's, it's Horton Plaza. Um, you know, we, we've seen recently, I think in 2018, 2019, Horton Plaza has shut down. Um, but when Horton Plaza was built in 1985, it was it was it was part of a downtown redevelopment er effort to bring people back into downtown. Um, you know, downtown was was not a great place to be at that time. Um, there wasn't much to do, not much reason to come downtown. So, uh, the city in, of San Diego kind of embarked on this effort to to build this this kind of landmark destination shopping center in downtown with the effort of of with the goal of bringing people back into downtown. And it, it largely succeeded in doing that. I mean, the gas lamp quarter just took off. Um, but over time, um, you know, the, the mall ran its course and, and now the retail component has faded. Um, and, and now Horton Plaza is in the process of being reinvented um, kind of as a technology hub and, and a mixed use development. So that's, that's gonna be exciting to kind of see the next chapter of it. Um, but, but Horton Plaza was very instrumental in, in placemaking for downtown San Diego. Um, another development was Peco Park. Um, Peco Park opened in 2004. Um, you know, this, this was a very instrumental development in, in, in kind of re-energizing the East Village and reinventing the East Village. You know, it was, it was a bunch of warehouses and industrial spaces. Now it's, it's, a, it's a vibrant kind of residential core. Um, lots of restaurants, um, some retail showing up. Um, and so, and now, you know, it's a great place to go see concerts and baseball games. So um, another, another kind of good example of a very large scale uh, placemaking and, and, and re-energizing um, a part of downtown. And then getting, getting a little bit smaller kind of on the neighborhood level, um, I think the neighborhood gateways around San Diego are, are pretty amazing. And, you know, these have all contributed to giving these neighborhoods identities, um, you know, giving, giving community members and citizens pride in their neighborhoods and their communities, and, and really have contributed to the place and, and how these, these neighborhoods have kind of evolved um, and then become unique destinations. You know, each one of these neighborhoods um, is, is unique in its own right and it has its own kind of character and, and, and attractions. And so, 
you know, something, something as simple as signage can, can really have an impact on placemaking. Um, and then an, another, another way that placemaking can occur is, is, is through tactical urbanism. Um, and what this is, is these are, this is a, a process in which, you know, somebody says, you know what, I want to go out and I want to, I want to, I want to change something or I want to do something. And it, it may go against the norms of what we might consider the normal process of, of getting something done or, or executing a project, permitting, things like that. So a good example of that is uh, the Washington Street Skate Park. Um, so this, this skate park is at the bottom of Washington Street. Um, it's underneath the freeway. Um, and, and what happened in 1999, a group of skaters got together, um, I, you know, kind of out of frustration, there were no dedicated skate parks in San Diego. Um, and, and, and skateboarders were, you know, were being ticketed and receiving citations for skating in public, public spaces and plazas. So they got together and they said, you know what, let's just start building our own skate park. And so they started this process uh, underneath, underneath the freeway um, and they got going, they actually built a skate park, um, but then the city came in and condemned it. Um, but, you know, they didn't give up and they, they pressed on, um, they lobbied the city in numerous city council meetings. They got support uh, from local leaders. They got support from, from donors and sponsors. Um, and they were actually able to work through the process with the city, get a permit in hand and, and complete and build the skate park and have it permitted. So um, pretty amazing um, example of, of um, tactical urbanism in San Diego. And then this is now a, a, a very well-known and renowned skate park uh, throughout the nation. So great example. Um, another good example is Courtyard in East Village. Uh, this was a, a group of grad students from the New School of Architecture that got together. Um, and you know they thought, well, maybe we can do something with one of these vacant lots downtown. And it was, it was never intended to be permanent. Um, it, was, it was understood that it would be temporary. Um, but, you know, they, they went out, they got a bunch of converted shipping containers, um, put in a, some food service, a bar, and a stage, and then now all of a sudden you've got an event area. Um, very, very successful. It's, it's now moved on. It's not in this location anymore, but if, if you've been down there to any events, it's a pretty, pretty, pretty cool space. And then on a more grassroots level and a, and a much smaller scale is, is parking day. Uh, so parking day is a, a national event. Um, it actually is occurring next week on Thursday, the September 17th. Um, these are some examples of the installations that we've done here at our office. Um, parking day is, is kind of a, a takeover of, of parking spaces and an event where anybody can go out, groups can go out and, and build a, a parklet in a parking space. And it, it's bringing attention to, to open space and healthy communities and, and parks. And so, you know, this is a great example again of just, just how you can, you can do a temporary, set up a temporary place in a temporary park, um, but it, it still is in that same vein, even as, you know, something as large scale as, as Central Park or some of those other examples. So keep an eye out for this on next Thursday. There's going to be a lot of examples out in the city. Um, we actually opted not to do one in front of our office, so we're going to support the ASLA chapter um, with a large parklet that's out in Chula Vista on, on 3rd Avenue. So uh, keep an eye out for those next Thursday. If you're driving around town, you'll probably see a few of those. Uh, all right, so now we'll, we'll start with the first park project. This is a North Park Mini Park. If you're not familiar with it, it's in, it's in North Park, uh, just off of University Avenue. Uh, the pink box here represents the Observatory Theater, so we're right behind the theater uh, between Granada and 29th Street. Um, this was the, the parking lot uh, before we got started. Um, the city owned the parking lot and it was pretty much closed to any kind of use. Um, really, the main use of the parking lot was a queue for, for the lines of the observatory theater on event, on event nights. Um, and then they also had the tour buses parked in the parking lot as well. Um, there were some other events that took place there. I think the, uh, the, uh, the San Diego Vintage Flea Market would, would, would be held there and, and some other uh, events on and off. Um, 
And then just a little bit of housekeeping with regards to the process. Um, the city of San Diego employs kind of a two-step process when they design parks. The first step is to develop what's called a general development plan. And this is kind of like a schematic or concept level plan. Once they get through that process, then they hire, they typically hire a second consultant to do the final design construction drawings and then get the park built. So I wanna make sure we're giving credit where credit's due here. So MIG uh, is another landscape architecture and planning firm. Um, they, they were employed by the, the city to develop the general development plan. And then we took over the second uh, half of the process in preparing the final design documents. Um, so this is, uh, this is the concept that MIG put together for that uh, general development plan. Um, and very much a, an urban plaza, um, open space, you know, kind of a multi-use area, you know, with the idea of that there's events gonna be held there. Uh, there's a stage for, for concerts. Um, and then there's these kind of wayfinding elements out here. And we'll talk a little bit about those in a minute. Um, so taking their initial concept and then developing a final plan, um, you can see our final design was still very much true to that original design. Um, again, the idea is that we've got a very large uh, multi-use space that can be programmed for all kinds of different events. Um, this is just a rendering that we use to show, you know, a food truck event. So we could bring food trucks, food trucks in. Um, there could be cafe seating out here. Maybe there's a uh, a band playing on the stage. And then we also got the movie theater or the movie screen. There won't actually be a screen mounted on the building, but there's, there's the opportunity that temporary screens could be brought in for, for movie nights and things like that. Um, so with a, with a park like this, programming is very, very important. Um, you know, how, how events are planned and how they're, how they're scheduled is going to be very important to the success of the project. So we're kind of just we're creating the canvas for it. And so it's, it's really up to the community then and the city to start getting these, these events. And I, I think they're gonna definitely happen. You know, so some examples of those events would be, would be concerts. Um, you know, we'd also like to see and envision food truck events or other, other kind of special events. Um, again, movie nights would be great in this park. Um, and then, the, the North Park Farmers Market on Thursday um, also fronts the park. It doesn't right now because of the construction, but um, normally it is it is on North Park Way right in front of the park. Um, and so the park's going to be a great, you know, kind of, it's going to support the farmer's market. It's going to have all this seating and, and areas so people can go to the farmer's market, get some food, and then they can go sit in the park. So, um, so that's going to be a, a really exciting kind of synergy. Um, and then I mentioned the San Diego Vintage Flea Market. Um, so it'd be great to see them be able to come back in. Um, you know, this, this image is, they're pretty dense in here with, with uh, vendors. Uh, so we, we don't quite have that much square footage when we, when, we, when we put in all the planting and landscape areas. So it'll be interesting to see how this, this market can come back and, you know, maybe they can go out and, and close off the streets similar to the, uh, the farmer's market to get this market back in there. Uh, so just a, a quick overview of the park and, and kind of some of the major amenities. So again, the, the most important piece of it is the, the kind of central open plaza um, and, and serving as a multi-use area. Um, we did, we did want to make sure that the park was somewhat usable for, for the community when there were not special events. So, you know, just on a normal day, you know, somebody can come to the park. We did put a kind of a spinner play structure in there. So there, you know, a mom with kids or a dad with kids could come and the kids could have something, something to do uh, to play on. There's also a series of musical instruments. And we thought that was kind of a nice little tie in with the theater and the, the things that happen at the observatory. So there's some musical instruments that, that kids and adults can play. Um, and then just a lot of seating, there's, there's shade trees, we've got these kind of round circular benches, and then we've got other benches around the edge. So again, you know, supporting things like the farmer's market or, you know, just, you know, lunch hour, somebody wants to go out, grab lunch, and then come sit in the park and have their lunch. Uh, we, we think there's, there's some great opportunities for that. Um, some, one of the additions that we added to the design that wasn't in it originally was this, this kind of monumental uh, North Park uh, wall here, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. And then the other item I mentioned before were these, these wayfinding elements. So these, these pylons that sit out here on the edge of the street. And these were very important in the original design. The idea is that these pylons 
are going to be visible from University Avenue. So they're they're set out on the edge of the of the edge of the property, out in the right of way on purpose. So we we want people as they're walking along or driving along University to be able to see these pylons, and they're really meant as kind of a hook to get people to come down to the park. Um, you know, peak interest. You know, what's going on? There's something there. I want to go see that, and and really draw people into the park. So, so that was a a very important element uh, to the design of the park. Um, so one of our one of our design partners on the project was Graphic Solutions, um, and so we worked with them pretty extensively on a whole number of iterations of, of concepts and sketches. Uh, you know, also looking at precedent images of uh, other types of pylons and other types of wayfinding elements. Um, and, and we, like I said, we went through a number of, of different studies on what it wanted to be, um, how it wanted to look. Um, one thing that we kind of identified early that was important is that we wanted to try to tie it in with, with the existing North Park sign out on university. And so we're doing that with the base. Um, so we're gonna do a similar tile treatment on the base. So we, we kind of make it feel like it's part of the family of, of North Park kind of street furniture. Um, this, this image here is, is probably most indicative of where we ended up in the design. It's not quite exactly like this, but pretty similar to this. So uh, another great, great kind of addition to the park. Uh, and then, so these are some of the images of that that monument wall. And so we're we're building these these letters. They're five feet tall. They're they're made out of concrete. They're going to be very solid, very permanent. Um, and we we like this idea of of having this this kind of grand entrance to the park. And again, you know, identifying the park, identifying the community, and then you know, hopefully, kind of creating this this so Kodak moment, you know, hopefully people are coming out here, you know, it's be a great place to, to have pictures taken. Um, and then it also kind of creates a nice little portal or gateway into the park. Um, we've got a, a circular area out here. These are gonna be a number of uh, donor pavers. The area is gonna look a little bit different than this. It, it didn't quite, the design didn't quite end up like this, but uh, this is kind of a neat, a neat little area with, with uh, donor pavers that, uh, uh, North Park Main Street has been able to sell, um, and we, from my understanding, we've got a number of those sold. So those those will be going in in the circle, um, and then the back side of that monument wall has got a nice long curb bench on both segments of it. So again, kind of creating some some seating areas in the park. You know, great place to sit if there's a movie or or a concert. Um, now I'm going to run through some photos of the site, kind of as we progress from from you know, pre-construction through different stages of construction, just to kind of give you an idea of the progress of the park. Um, so that, let me back up. So the first one obviously is the pre-construction condition. Um, this is uh, right after demolition of all the asphalt. Um, there was a, a bunch of concrete that was found underground. So we pulled all that out of the ground as well. Um, this is the, the earthwork and the grading uh, kind of taking shape in the park. Uh, this is the beginning of the, the flat work and the concrete work uh, starting to take shape. Uh, the, the landscape area is starting to get filled in with topsoil, cobble. Um, this, this darker area here in the middle is a stormwater retention area. So this is where we're treating all of our stormwater, um, but you know, trying to do it in a really aesthetic and, and pleasing way that's gonna um, you know, enhance the park and not detract from it. There you can see that that little spinner play element. Um, and then this picture, we took this just last week. Um, the flat work is, is filling in some more. And so we'll see a lot more of this getting filled in. The, the major element that's still outstanding are these, uh, the large letters, um, they're in production right now. So I believe we should be seeing those sometime this month. Um, and once those go in, then then the rest of the park will, will, will fill out in, and be able to be completed. So. So that's, that's a little overview of, of North Park Mini Park. Um, and now I'm gonna talk a little bit about Sweetwater Park in, in Chula Vista. So again, this is a, a much different project. Uh, this is a 40 acre kind of resource-based park. Uh, the client on this project was the Port of San Diego. Um, and this, this park is part of the larger Chula Vista Bayfront redevelopment and master plan. Uh, so to give you a little bit of context, this is the Chula Vista Bayfront. Um, the Living Coast Discovery Center sits out here, if you've ever been there. Uh, it used to be called the Chula Vista Nature Center. Um, 
right now there's uh here's the existing marina in chula vista there's a park that exists here right now it's called bayside park um, but this is going to get redeveloped and we worked on the schematic design for this park this is going to be harbor park which is a new waterfront park um, sweetwater park occurs up here um, and then part of our park includes this environmental buffer that will be improving um, and then the the big catalyst project for the whole bayfront is this uh, hotel and conference center uh, so this is a Gaylord Hotel. It's being developed by Rita Development. Um, it's it's pretty much through design. We'll we'll be starting to see some demolition work uh, starting up out there. Um, but this is this is the real financial driver for the entire Bayfront development. So once this project, uh, the agreements were in place for this project, uh, the next project that took place was the RV resort. So there's a brand new RV resort that just opened. Um, and what this was, there was an existing RV resort down here, so they had to they had to relocate that resort to make room for the new hotel. So that project is done now; it's cleared the way uh, for the hotel. And then the next project, kind of in the in the phase of projects, is going to be Sweetwater Park that we're currently in design. Um, just to give you a sense of some of the the images from the site, it's a it's a very very wide open. Um, and flat site, uh, it, it, it's right on the shore of, of San Diego Bay. Uh, this is a view looking north. You can see the Living Coast Discovery Center. They're just kind of peeking up on the horizon. Um, it's another view looking kind of northeast across the site. Uh, view looking northwest. And then a view looking south. So we've got the the uh, boat works uh, just to the south of us and that's kind of the neighbor. Um, one of the things that we wanted to understand before we started designing this project is, is kind of where the Chula Vista Bayfront has been historically and there's been a number of land uses that have occurred. So um, starting probably in the mid 1800s, but one of the most significant um, industrial uses that occurred uh, at the Bayfront was the Hercules powder plant. And so this was a, a gunpowder production plant. And so they harvested kelp in the ocean, they brought it in here, processed it, and from the kelp, they, they um, manufactured gunpowder. Um, so this plant was in, in existence from 1916 to 1920. During that time, the gunpowder uh, supported most of the gunpowder that was used in World War I. So uh, a pretty significant uh, industry and, and event that happened uh, during that time. Um, and then from the gunpowder plant, uh, a cottonseed oil refinery opened up on the Bayfront and operated there for about nine years. Uh, after cottonseed, farming moved in. Um, there were a lot of tomato farms uh, down on the Bayfront. Um, I included this, this poster from the movie Attack of the Killer Tomatoes. So that was filmed in 1978. Um, it was filmed exclusively in San Diego, um, a, different, a number of different locations around San Diego. And one of those locations was the Chula Vista Bayfront. So a little bit of, little bit of movie history there with the Bayfront. Um, and then another, another very significant and large uh, in industry was Roar Aircraft Cor Corporation that operated there from 1940 to 1997. Um, 1997, they were sold to BF Goodrich, who still operates at the Bayfront, and, and there is still some aircraft manufacturing uh, parts that go on there. So that legacy kind of continues today. Um, so then jumping back real quick to the Bayfront um, and understanding the, the pieces that, that kind of had to be in place before the parks could start. Again, that, 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 that core financial driver was a hotel and conference center then the RV resort coming on next. And then now we're, now we're developing the Sweetwater Park as, as the third development. Another important development is over here. It's a mixed use residential development and that's being uh, developed by Pacifica Development. Um, we're actually involved with that project as well. So I've got a few images here to kind of give you a sense of, of what all these are gonna look like. So, so this is the new Rita uh, Resort Hotel and Conference Center. Um, you know, It's gonna be overlooking the water, great location. Um, they're going to have a, a very large kind of water park development that goes along with it. Um, this is, uh, these are some of the renderings of the RV resort uh, that Sun, Sun Outdoors built. Um, this is a completed project now, so you can go down there and actually see the RV resort. Um, and then these are some renderings of the Pacifica development. Again, this is, this is currently in, desi in design. 
so uh, construction hasn't quite started on this project, um, but it it will will very soon. Um, and then getting back to to the site, um, so that RV resort sits up here just to the north of us. Uh, the boat work sits down here to the south, and then just a little bit further south over here is the uh, the hotel and conference center site. So we've got this big wide open area uh, right along the San Diego Bay. Um, we we butt up against the San Diego National Wildlife Refuge, um, and that's important because um, part of part of what we're trying to do is not only create recreation and create opportunities for people to come to the Bayfront, but we're also trying to protect some of these sensitive resources. Um, so there was, there was a number of development goals that the project had. Um, and I'll just kind of go through these very quickly. Um, we needed to satisfy curiosity about natural areas, um, but then we also needed to buffer and protect sensitive resources. Um, we needed to make sure that we, we protected resources, but then at the same time, we wanted to encourage interaction uh, with the environment. Um, the park is envisioned as an active and hands-on experience, um, but we're trying to do that with, with a passive interpretation and I'll kind of show you what that means. Um, the park should support passive serenity, um, but we also wanna provide a healthy and active adventure and, and opportunity for the community. Um, and then we also wanna integrate art and design, um, but be careful that we, we, we kind of keep focus on embracing the natural context of the Bay. So, so those are some of the, the core kind of overarching goals of, of the project. Um, and so then as we started thinking about, well, what are all these, these uh, recreational elements that we could bring into this project that would support these goals? So um, being a park, you know, we, we wanna have play areas. So, but we want those play areas to be kind of focused on, on natural themes. Um, so uh, we looked at adventure, adventure type play areas, uh, nature-based play areas. Um, we also had this idea of creating a, a kind of a dune adventure area where kids could, could run up and down sand dunes and play in the sand, but not, not be the kind of typical sand play area that you would find in, in a playground and you know and this seems to fit very nicely with the context of the park. Um, we wanted to have you know open play meadows. So one of the things that the park is not allowed to do, it's not allowed to to host or or uh, to have organized sports events. So we can't we can't have soccer games there. We can't have softball games, but we want to create kind of a, a large open meadow that kids can still go out and run around and and have fun. Um, so we looked at some typologies of, of kind of natural meadows and, and how we might be able to do that without doing a, a fully cultivated lawn. Um, picnic area is very important. Again, this, is, this kind of fits in with the passive recreation that we're trying to, trying to uh, in, enforce in the, in the park. Uh, biking and hiking trails, very important. So we'll see a lot of those in the design. Um, and then we also want to have interpretive elements um, and signs. We want to be able to educate people about the park, about the environment. Um, so these, these are going to be very important in the design. Um, and then we also wanted to be able to support volunteer efforts. You know, we thought it would be great if, if the port could organize volunteer efforts to maybe do, you know, some, some annual replanting of plants or, or, you know, maintaining some of the native plant communities that we're going to be be putting into the park. So we wanna make sure we have an area for this. Um, and then public arts, uh, another important component of the park. So the port has a 1% a for art policy. And so 1% of the, the park budget is going to be going to, to public art. We went through a, a pretty extensive uh, public artist selection process. Um, we selected an artist, his name is Roberto Salas. Um, I think he's originally from San Diego. So very much rooted in the region. And we haven't quite got started working with him yet, but I'm excited to do that and, and, and see what he's kind of envisioned for, for art in, in the project. Um, so before we started the design process, we, we went through a number, we went through three very large community input uh, meetings. Um, and this was important to, to engage the community, solicit input um, that, would, that would go into the design. Um, and so through those meetings, we created a number of surveys uh, that were, you know, provided at the workshops, but then we also provided these online uh, so people would have an opportunity to provide input if they weren't able to make the meeting. 
Um, so in that very first workshop, we received 583 responses to our survey, which was amazing. Um, you know, normally we're happy if we get 100 to 150, but getting 583 was amazing. And so, uh, you know, we were able to go back to the community in the next meeting and summarize all the results. And then this is, this is kind of what drove the design um, and, and informed us on what types of things the community wanted to see in the, in the park. Um, so this is the, the concept that, that uh, resulted from all that community input process. Um, and this is kind of what we're the framework of what we're working through right now in design. Some things are, are changing and we're tweaking things here and there to refine them, but, but generally a quick overview. So there's a, a main parking lot that greets people as they arrive to the park. We've got kind of a, a, an arrival sequence coming into the park. Uh, we have a restroom building here. Um, we created a, a, what we're calling a group education ring here. So we, we like to see the park being used by school groups or you know, possibly even the Living Coast Discovery Center bringing groups over as well um, to use the park. Oh, sorry about that. Um, and then we've got our nature play area over here. We've got that large multi-use meadow picnic areas arranged around the meadow. And then in that dune adventure area uh, kind of sits down here at the south end. Uh, and then we've got a nice little boardwalk that's going to extend out over the sand and, and create a, a neat little experience. And then again, trails. We've got trails all throughout the park. Um, this is a, a bike path that was an early action item that was that was built under an urban greening grant. And I'll talk a little bit about that at the end. Uh, so that's, that's kind of the quick overview of the park. Um, I'm going to run through a few of the renderings that we put together. So this is uh, the arrival sequence, uh, kind of a bird's eye looking into the park. You can see our restroom building up here. Uh, that group education area sits over here and then our meadows out in the distance there. Um, another view of that arrival sequence, the restroom building, the education ring, um, our meadow, and then some of the trails out kind of going south. Um, we spent a lot of time on this restroom building um, and we have a design partner with R&T Architects that worked with us to develop this and a great concept. I'm gonna explain uh, that, that concept in just a bit, but we'll get through a couple more renderings here. Uh, this is the, the nature playground area. Um, and then this is that dune adventure area. So, you know, kind of building up sand dunes, getting some natural logs and rock features in here. Um, and then there's that boardwalk that's going to extend out over the dunes as it wraps around the south south end of the meadow. Uh, and then further south, we created a uh, an overlook plaza. Um, th this is the a terminus of um, what is F Street in Chula Vista, and then extends all the way out to the park. Um, and so this we thought this would be a nice way to kind of terminate that street and create this this kind of symbolic overlook area for the park. Um, and then this is a view uh, as you enter that kind of open meadow area. We've got some shade structures here and very informal seating with boulders. Uh, another element that we're incorporating in the design are these bird blinds. And so we're right up again, again we're right up against the National Wildlife Refuge. So we've got a large buffer area. Um, that's part of the park. Uh, it, it won't allow people to go out into the buffer, but we're putting these bird blinds kind of right on the edge of it. So hopefully people can get a chance to get up, get up close and maybe see some migratory birds or native birds um, without flushing them. Um, and then this is that uh, donor or not donor, but the volunteer area where we were hoping that we can support some volunteer efforts uh, in the park. And then getting back to the restroom building. So, um, you know, a, a, rest, a park restroom building is very functional. And so we wanted to try to make it more than just a restroom building. Uh, so we, we came up with this idea of this solar calendar. Um, and so we've got this, this overhang, this roof overhang out in the front of the building. And it's got an opening in it. We call it the Oculus. Um, the building is oriented on the north-south axis. Um, so what happens is as the sun tracks across the sky, the sun's going to cast a beam through this oculus and then onto the onto the plaza below and then we'll have a solar calendar that's kind of inscribed in the concrete so this will be a little bit of an interactive feature you know again trying to think of you know how can this restroom be more than just a restroom um, so it'll be a nice little feature people can come out and kind of track the sun and, and track it by month and day so nice nice little element uh, and then we've also got interpretive signage. 
so some of the other examples I showed you before were part of the bike path project. And so we're gonna be supplementing a lot of those interpretive signs with more signs in the park. Um, obviously birds are very important down here in the South Bay. Um, Chula Vista sits kind of on the, on the national uh, or the Pacific Flyway. And so this is a very important corridor for, for uh, migratory birds. So we'll be talking about you know, species that are endemic and then also migratory species. Uh, we're, we're touching on some Kumeyaay history in the South Bay and then another, a number of other uh, topics. And then I know we're getting short on time here, so I'm gonna try to hurry up. So this is, this is the bike path project that I talked about. Um, so this originally was part of the, the overall park, but uh, working with the Port of San Diego, we were able to get an urban greening grant uh, to implement this bike path as an early action item. And so that's, that's in now, it's, it's installed, it's open. Um, so I'm just gonna run through a few pictures. Um, so it's a multi-use bike path. It's open to both pedestrians and bicyclists. Uh, we did create kind of a, a, a decomposed granite shoulder. So it'd make it a little bit more comfortable for pedestrians if they didn't wanna be uh, in the same multi-use path with, with bicyclists. Um, Here's an image of how it kind of wraps around the boat works. And so what this path is going to do is eventually it's going to wrap around here and it's going to connect to that future harbor park that's going to be out in front of the, the hotel and conference center. So ultimately, this path is going to extend all the way through the entire bayfront, um, but will be implemented in, in different phases. Uh, another view of the, the bike path looking, looking south and then that, that decomposed granite uh, kind of shoulder path that we've we put in, we have areas where it's adjacent to the, the bike path, but then there's other areas where it, it kind of diverges and goes out a little bit and then comes back in. So it creates a nice nice kind of experience getting through um, the bike path. So you can either be on the main path or take this, this little spur path. Uh, and then these are some examples of the interpretive elements that we we put in with the bike path. And then we're gonna, we're gonna be carrying this theme through the park. So all the new interpretive elements in the park are, are gonna be kind of on the same theme and, and have the same look. So it all ties in um, and, and matches. So that's, that's it. Um, that's my presentation on North Park Mini Park and Sweetwater Park. Um, and hopefully we have a time for some questions. Yeah. Thank you, yeah. Chris. Thanks, yeah. Chris. That's this was awesome. great. Yeah. Really exciting. Um, we do have a couple of questions here in the Q&A, um, which we can address really quick. Trendy, Tracy, sorry. Yeah. Tracy asks, how much community feedback did you obtain for the North Park project? Yeah. And you, yeah, sorry. A answer that one first. <laughs> so, so we did not actually go through the community process on that one. So again, you know, I talked about that two-step process. So MIG, um, who, who ran the project through the, the general development plan, that's typically when the community involvement occurs. And so they, they went through the community input process. And I, I do believe there was a number of community meetings that went along with that process. Um, now, when we took over the project, we did go back to the community a couple of times with some updates, um, mm -hmm. but our process was not community input. It was more about updating the community on progress. Um, but that, that, that input process did happen during the, the general development phase. And that's kind of where the, the concept for the park came from. Gotcha. And did you guys hold forums or speak with the community planning, planning boards and councils? What was? Um, so again, we, we didn't do that. Um, the, the, we did have some special community meetings that the city organized. Um, and so it wasn't, I don't think they were tied to any formal meetings. It was just, hey, we're gonna have a community meeting. This is the date. Um, but I think, I think the meetings that MIG went through may have been tied or probably were tied with the community planning group. Yeah. Cool. Great. Um, and Laura, Laura Schwartz is asking why there's so much concrete yeah. in the North Park. And, and the concrete's intentional, you know, and it's an urban plaza and it's, it's meant to be a multi-use space, you know, mm -hmm. in order to support all those types of events, we do need to have a large open plaza. And I, I think that's what's going to make this park special and make it activated. Um, you know, when you see things like that, that, 
that flea market that takes place, you know, those are the kinds of events that we want to see happen there. We want to see concerts. Um, you know, we wanted to be able to get vehicles in there. So if, if there are food trucks, you know, we had to make sure the plaza was built to sustain that. Um, and so that's, that's really, that's really the, the driving factor. It's, it's not a, you know, lawn and trees kind of park, although we, you know, we wanted to have a balance of that. So we wanted to have green space in there. Um, but really the driver for that park is to, to be kind of a community event space. Practical. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Nice. Um, There's a question in the chat um, from Molly Thompson, and she says, <clears throat> I love seeing the history worked out into the design considerations. I'm curious what the research of the different neighborhoods and consulting with locals looks like in all these different neighborhoods. Uh, I'm sure it's not a one size fits all when it comes to park designs in different areas. So can you talk a little bit about that process and is it different for every project? Um, it is different for every project, you know, um, you know, if you look at North Park Mini Park, so it sits in the heart of North Park. So obviously that, that community and that neighborhood is going to have a lot of input and we want to, we wanted to make sure that that, that was, you know, incorporated into the project and a driver. And then if you look at Sweetwater Park in contrast, you know, that's, that's going to kind of function more as a regional park. It's a regional destination. Um, and so, you know, our, our community meetings were held in Chula Vista, um, but we really wanted to try to grab, you know, a greater, you know, maybe county uh, involvement. And we, we did to some extent. Um, honestly, it's sometimes it's hard to get people to come out to workshops. Um, uh, with Sweetwater Park, we didn't have that problem. And I'm, I'm guessing when, when MIG went through the process with, with North Park Mini Park, they probably, there was probably a great deal of involvement there as well. Um, we, we saw a lot of turnout when we were just doing our updates. Um, so, so yeah, it's, it's also, it's very important to kind of consider context, you know, in, in Sweetwater Park, in looking through the history of the site, you know, we're trying to draw upon that and think about how we can incorporate some of those things. We want to make sure, you know, at, at least at an educational level, we're going to be incorporating that history into some of the interpretive elements because we think it's important for people to come there and understand, you know, where that park site has been and, and what's happened there. And, and I think most people wouldn't know that, you know, unless you actually sit down and start looking at it. And so, um, so it's, it's kind of exciting when we look at these park projects and kind of see where they've been and, and, you know, hopefully some of those things start to inform a story that can be told in the design. Great. Uh, I got another question in the chat. Um, with smaller scale community placemaking, how are you able to get city buy-in, for example, for the skate parks? Um, Hands on. Yeah. So, you know, skate parks, you know, usually come about with community pressure. And, um, you know, if, the, if, if a community feels strongly about something and they want an improvement, you know, I, I think there's been a lot of a lot of examples of community communities effectively uh, lobbying city to get things done. Um, we just started a new project at a small park in La Jolla, and it was completely driven by the community. You know, they wanted they wanted new play equipment in this park, and so the community got organized. They went out, they consulted with a, a play manufacturer on their own outside of the city. They came up with a design. And then they use that design to then lobby the city to try to get a project going and they were successful. And so now it's, we're, we're actually designing a new playground for this community based on the, the upfront work that they put in to, to bring this to the city's attention and, and bring, bring attention to it. And, th and that's honestly, that's how a lot of skate parks happen too. Um, there's a, it starts with community interest and then it takes, it takes a few individuals to, to kind of dedicate themselves and, you know, lobbying your, 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 your local leaders, um, your council representatives, um, and, and just going out and bringing attention to the project. And it, it's, it's possible. So. Yes. We, we do have a question in the Q and a here from Susan as well, asking if you guys have any graphic designers on staff, or do you work with graphic design studios in San Diego? So we, we don't have any, graphic designers on staff. We do have uh, one of our marketing uh, professionals has a, has a graphic design background. And so she does help us with things. Um, you know, 
when we we're actually developing all the interpretive signs ourselves um, and we think we've been pretty successful with the ones that we've already developed um, but we we also understand our limitations and so when when we feel like we're we're getting into an area that's maybe a little bit beyond us. We do we do go out and seek professionals. Um, mm -hmm. So you know we work with Graphic Solutions a lot um, on a lot of our signage projects. So um, you know we we don't we don't pretend to think that we can do everything. Um, and so it's important important to engage professionals um, and specialties when it's appropriate for sure. Nice, makes sense. <laughs> There's, uh, we've got another question in the chat here from Pablo Cortez. Uh, curious if any thought was given to potential transient activity in these parks. Every time, that's been addressed. every time. Um, right. So I, I'll tell you when we go, when we go and have community meetings um, and talk about new park projects with the community, that's always the number one. Um, homeless, the homeless issue is probably the number one issue and then bathrooms are number two. Um, and that's, that's, very very consistent so so yeah homelessness is very very important and a concern and so um we when we when we approach projects like this we try to um make sure that there's a lot of thought into how how the park design starts to develop um there's there's uh you know considerations for where we place trees where we place landscaping where we place improvements we're trying to maintain some transparency to the park. So, you know, if a police officer is out patrolling around the park in the street, we want to make sure that there's there's lines of sight through the park uh, to see activity that's that's less desirable. Um, you know, in 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 North Park Mini Park, the neighbors are going to be, and not not the residential neighbors, but the business neighbors are going to play a role in that too, because right now they already have cameras on on the outside of their buildings they've been monitoring the park or at least the the parking lot before it was a park and so mm -hmm. there's there's going to be some kind of shared monitoring between between the businesses you know the city now maintaining a park um, and then i think even the the surrounding community members will have eyes on the park and and be able to inform when there's some some illicit activity um, and then when we look at we look at something like sweetwater park the big park there is a homeless problem out there right now. Um, there's encampments out there because it's just a wide open open space. Um, so the port's already been taking some measures. Some large trees have been removed um, that were won't be part of the park design. Um, but then again, as we as we develop the park, we're trying to make it uh, in a way that we don't create these opportunities for people to camp out. Um, it's going to be a little bit more difficult with a large park like that because it's going to take a little bit more um effort in patrolling the park and keeping eyes on it but again hopefully with with activity with people being in the park every day it'll it'll help um kind of deter some of that um you know we've we've we talked about that rv resort that's just north of us so this park is going to be full of people every day coming from the rv park it already is the bike path is being used extensively um, by the rv park uh residents so um, so that's gonna that's gonna help. Just activating these spaces um, does a lot to deter homelessness. Uh, I don't see any other questions um, in the in the chat, uh, but I, I have one for you, Chris. If, sure. If we want to close it out on that, um, uh, what are your favorite parks in San Diego? And where, where do you take your out of town visitors when they come to <laughs> visit you? <laughs> oh boy. You know, okay, so the, the default San Diego park is Balboa Park. You know, that's that's kind of our landmark park. You know, love taking visitors there. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the water is amazing, you know, and, and being in a coastal, a coastal city, to me, that's that's what San Diego is all about. So, you know, places like La Jolla Shores. Um, you know, even even Pacific Beach. I love Crown Point. I love the the boardwalk around Crown Point. I think that's a great place. Um, you know, I think just anywhere we can interact with the water. Um, that's to me. That's what San Diego is all about. And and that's that's where I want to take out of town visitors. <laughs> yeah. And you know, something like Sweetwater Park. You know, it's part of the part of the mandate of this park is because we're we're right on the coast of the uh, or the shore of. Of San Diego Bay, um, we've got to provide coastal access. Um, 
we can't get people physically to the water because of the, the environmental buffer that we've got to maintain. Um, but we're trying to do that in other ways. So we're trying to, we're trying to create visual access to the water um, and, and doing things that get people there maybe through, through views and vistas, but we can't actually get them and touch the water. That'll happen down at the other park at Harbor Park. So that'll be the, the, the place where people can actually get down and interact with the water. But um, we won't be able to do that here. But again, to me, that's, that's what San Diego is all about. Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, any, any last questions um, or thoughts from you, Chris? No, I'm just, I'm happy we, uh, we had a number of participants on a Friday afternoon, and I'm glad people were interested in the topic, and, and hopefully, you know, we'll go out and see these parks, you know, North Park Mini Parks in construction, so it's, it's a great time to drive by and, and watch the progress, if, you know, and, and honestly, I think, I think Chula Vista Bayfront has not been on a lot of people's radar for a long time, but now is the time to go down there, because it's, it's going to be evolving so fast. Um, you know, just having that RV resort developed and then having the bike path now, now is a great time to get down there and see it because it's going to be changing quite a bit over the next few years. Great. Yes. Well, thank okay. you. This was great. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Chris. Um, All right. Thank you. Thank you to San Diego Design Week for, for hosting us and this. And um, everybody, of course, go go check out the other uh, presentations and stuff that's happening this weekend and go out and see some parks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Okay. Happy Friday, everyone. Have a all good right. Day. Thank you. Thank you all.